world. My part of the world is Miami, Florida. I'm Captain Bill Gustin with Miami Dade Fire Rescue Department, and I need a haircut. So we've got to stop this lockdown. Either than that, or I'm going to have to get a uh, get a guitar. So uh, we have a real interesting program. Uh, our, our topic will be addicts and cock law fires. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, Key. That's KeithHose.com. Now, within the last hour, I got a call from a, uh, a firefighter in, in Canada uh, with asking for my recommendations on, uh, on, on hose for standpipe operations. And I said, well, I, I cannot make any specific recommendations without knowing your buildings and flow testing and all that. But, but what I can tell you is this, you cannot do better than key combat ready hose or their true ID two and a half and two and a quarter hose. When you're operating in a standpipe situation with possibly inadequate outlet pressures and in tight spaces, you're looking at a high potential for kinks. You want a hose that is going to have amazing kink resistance. And as I say in every one of these uh, hangouts that we have, take the key challenge. Uh, contact uh, keyhose.com. Get a few sticks, as they call them. Take them out and tie them in a tie them in a knot and see if you can kink that hose. And I don't think that you will. Um, I'm going to introduce, we have a special guest, and I've been told by the, uh, the stack, uh, our panels, that sometimes we're too lengthy on introducing ourselves. So uh, that's all you need to know about me. But uh, I want to introduce, and I'm very proud and grateful to introduce uh, Dave Walsh. Uh, and what Dave Walsh is doing right now, Dave Walsh was a firefighter. Well, he's still a firefighter because we're all going to be fire. It's like Marines. You're always going to be a firefighter. Um, and then if any of you have uh, presented at FDIC, you know that you, you can't get past Dave Walsh. He's in the AV Boneyard, and he's helped out dozens and dozens of instructors. What I want to really give him credit for is he knows that our firefighters, especially the volunteers right now, up in New York State, up in the Northeast, have a severe case of cabin fever. And he has brilliantly put together small half hour presentations on just the basic things that we all need to review once a year as firefighters, doesn't matter how long you're on the job. God bless you. He's, uh, when's your next one, Dave? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. What will be the topic? Uh, we're talking about interior firefighter qualifications, uh, initial, annual, in, in terms of what OSHA says and, and what common sense says. Right. And how do we avail ourselves to, to uh, your... Uh, you need the Zoom link. So the, the easiest way to do it, I don't know any other way, is just shoot me an email, um, dkwalsh81 at gmail.com, and I can share that with you. We also, what we've been doing is anytime my feeble memory remembers, we record them and post them on a Dropbox and there's a, a link. So if you can't make it or the kids are screaming or whatever, you can go back later on and watch them and, and critique. And, and he, he encourages you to sit back, relax with your favorite adult beverage in hand. And it's a good time. It's lively. It's interesting. Uh, your incident command examination. Now that is about as dry as you get. And you did really, you hit a home run on that one. So God Thanks, bless sir. you for what you're doing. Now, um, I need you, I'm going to give you some advice. <laughs> Today, when we get finished with this Zoom hangout and you're going to the United Parcel UPS store to send that Scott bottle lamp to me, UPS, wear a mask, okay? <laughs> all right, Captain Mike, Captain, all right, keep, keeping up with the, uh, the Irish contingent. Captain Mike, a little bit about yourself, sir. Mike Dugan, I'm the same as I was the last time we were here together. It's nice to see you all again. And uh, my bald-headed brother, Dan Shaw. <laughs> Just like Mike, sa same guy. Uh, glad to contribute to the conversation again today, Bill. Okay, and then a little bit later on, I'm going to give a shout-out to our bald-headed brother that uh, – actually, two bald-headed brothers. Uh, that would be uh, – Daryl Liggins and from Oakland, 
He's busy today with training, and so is uh, Sam Hiddle from uh, Wichita. So, and Jason Hobelman is uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to him. His dad has either passed away or he's in the process, and he's got his hands full with that. So, and also he's chief of a of a department that is uh, a lot of responsibility right now heaped upon him with the with the virus. So, how about this other guy here? This Halston guy. I remember listening to a guy. He was interviewed about a fire in a, in uh, Dubai, and the guy kept referring to him as Bobby Halston. You remember that? It was like a Christmas or New Year's Eve. Yeah, it was on uh, MSNBC. Oh no, that's a that's a that's a that's the channel that I watch all the time to get. I, I better be all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you to go there. I'm not going there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. To our topic at hand. Now you're going to have to help me. Everybody see this picture. Okay. One of the most valuable lessons that we can teach our new young firefighters is how much friggin' fire you can have over your head and not know it. And the danger, of course, is ceiling collapse and a rapid intensification of a fire because it's oxygen deprived, ventilation limited up in that space. And what do we do? We take pipe poles, we punch a hole in the ceiling and essentially open up uh, the damper of a wood burning stove. So um, now, one of the inherent hazards with a attic fire is getting up to examine the attic. Now, Captain Mike, you, you've been called a lot of things in your life, but one of them is not petite. So I'm thinking that maybe would you have any reservations uh, about climbing up this fold down ladder? Uh, go up and look at this attic. Without a doubt, Bill, I would take and throw Sam Hiddle up there. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't climb up there. The first no. thing you have to remember about those attic ladders is who put them in. Yes. And did the homeowner put them in himself or what did he have a contract to put them in? I put my own in, but I know it's in there. Well, because I use it, but I use it. Well, not anymore because I'm getting too old to crawl around the attic. But again, the idea of going up into that attic is number one, you want to put somebody going up there with a hose line. You don't want to put the officer up there and you want to put somebody going up there who's small enough to give you a quick look around. It can move quickly up there. Okay, us old guys are not the ones who should be on that ladder. Uh, and and my, Captain Mike, uh, I still have folks that say, well, we don't need to go up there. We have ticks. You got nine inches of insulation laying on the top of the upper side of that ceiling. You're not going to see squat with a tick. You're going to have to get up there one way, shape, or form. And uh, Can I give you a point on this that was yes. brought to me by my senior man, and it was the best thing. We were at an odor of smoke on uh, 1001 Montgomery Street. And we go there and it's right at the meal time. And we get there in the afternoon. We had just got the, the, the chow, you know, was just on the table and we get a run. And with the chief, the, the chief is like an 18 for an odor. And I'm like, hang on a second, chief. And the guy says, no, come here. And he takes me out to the fire escape. And he points to the uh, vent on what we call a cockloft vent. Cockloft, yeah, yeah. okay. Cockloft doesn't have stairs going into it. That's what we call in New York. Right. But he points to the vent, and I look up at the vent, and I don't see anything. And all of a sudden, I see a puff, and there's smoke comes out. And I said to the chief, "No, no, no, chief, hold on, hold all the guys, hang on a second. And we go in there, and we pop a hole in the ceiling, and we get smoke. It's the blown-in insulation. But what my senior man did is, I used to tick, and I couldn't see anything. He was my chauffeur. And he came up and he said, Cap, give me the tick. And I said, okay. Took the tick and he went to the, to the roof because it was a flat roof building. Took the tick up on a roof. And he said, okay, where we were before in that apartment, one over is where the fire is. And I was like, son of a bitch. I never would have thought to take the tick up onto the roof to look at it from a different angle because of it was all the blown in nitrocellular insulation blown in there. Okay, and it was around the light fixture on one bedroom, and that's where it started. But he was smart enough, my chauffeur was smart enough to say, give me the tip. 
And from that point on, I requisitioned the second tick. So we had a tick that one of the guys could use on the outside of the building to go in and look around. And it was the smartest thing. And again, it was somebody, you know, you got to tra train your people, teach your people to be resourceful. And when they are, you've got to reward them for it. It was the greatest move I ever saw. You know, um, I'm kind of a low tech guy. But I'll tell you, Captain Mike, drones, bring them on, man. A drone that's got a FLIR, don't be laughing. You're laughing at me, not with me, Dave Walsh uh, and Dan Shaw. Okay. Um, They're laughing at your phone, Bill. Right. Okay. They're not laughing at me. Uh, I'm all for drones. I'm all for drones. And also, uh, I think back on some um, line of duty death fires where the first indication that you had a, a fire condition is when it breaches the roof. Or... I know that you guys and the FDNY, you send your roof guy up there and they it's muscle memory. They go over and they touch the soil pipes. Absolutely. They touch the soil pipes. They look over the sides at the vents in the cock loft. They look at the vents. They look for melted snow on a roof, dry spot on a wet day. They look for any sags. They look for anything else. And it is muscle memory. It's going up on the roof a lot. And that's why on every run you go up on a roof so you're comfortable with them. You get up there and you go through it. If it's food on the stove, you're going to pop the bulkhead anyway, let the odor out. So you go up there and you walk around and you get familiar. And it is that muscle memory. And it's knowing what you're doing and practicing. And, and you know, plumbing is the culprit. And any, a crawl space, a kitchen, a bathroom, um, anything like that. If you get a fire in there, uh, it gets in the kitchen cabinets from a pot on the stove. You know where it's going, man. It's following that plumbing. Uh, Dave, hey Bill, can I, can I add one thing to what, what Mike was saying? And I, I think we all universally agree is that no operational manual or SOP will ever put out a fire. But if you if you don't have those documents that guide some of your tactical operations, you're missing a mark because they really are legacy documents and that they, they take the experience you learn and put them into it. And I'm you know, I'm thinking of the two things you just related to, right? So the interior stairs on a drop down for an attic space. You know, we've learned over time is that we, we put in our operations manuals is that we don't use those. You know, we, you bring your own folding ladder that we put up there. And, and I liken that too, if we rolled up on a fire and there was some rickety ladder hanging up to the second floor window, we wouldn't use that. We throw our ladders up and we, we use that. And, you know, you talk about like the commercial building fires, you know, one of the things we mandated in our strip shopping center manual was that, hey, when the truck gets to the roof, they are required to give a report back to the chief. And we, we set the units up correctly that if you get a tower ladder and a straight truck, that the tower ladder always gets the front and the straight truck gets the back because of the, the parapet. And when they get up on that roof, you know, their, their job is to report back to the chief, to Mike's point of making that muscle memory, like, hey, look, you're going to study this manual to get promoted to truck boss well then you're going to remember this that when you are given that assignment and you go up to that that strip shopping center and you go up on a roof like hey i gotta tell the chief something oh i gotta report if there's a firewall i gotta report if there's melting tar or melted snow or if there's actual smoke or fire showing what are some of the obstructions on top of the roof yeah so you have to take that opportunity to, like don't get caught up into the hey a manual's not gonna put out my fire no a manual's gonna pass along those things you learn over the experiences of going to fires and put them into a piece of paper that someone, the least common denominator who doesn't have a good senior man can read and go, Oh, that's why the Lou goes up on the roof and reports that back because of this. So I think it's, you know, really valuable stuff that, you know, we're sharing here, but put it on paper, you know, and, and get that, get that information and then teach it and know the why behind it. And it's so vitally important for us to be successful on the fire ground. And in your operations manuals, in reference to uh, attics and cock loft, if you do suspect fire in the attic and cock loft, at what location do you make your initial hole with your pipe pole? You make your initial hole in the ceiling. So if you have some indication, if you know your first do, I mean, it, it, that, that leads a lot into it. But we always go to the edges uh, because, of, you know, a lot of times we'll see people put, you know, four by eight sheets of plywood. Uh, along the center rafters so they can have some sort of storage. So, you know, if you go in the corners, probably people are too lazy to push that four by eight sheet of plywood in the corner. So if you poke it into the corner by where the soffit runs into it, perhaps you'll be able to get some uh, uh, understanding if you have any smoke or fire up there. 
you know, and when I teach, when I go around and I teach, I ask uh, the group in this region, does the half finished half story floor extend beyond the knee wall? And if it uh, does not, well, then you can you can begin by pulling that ceiling from from below. Uh, but we got to be very careful that we pull the ceiling where we make entry, uh, where we can get blown out, thrown out, jump out of the way, whatever, right at the door. This should be in everybody's vocabulary if you are a, a student of the fire service. Wall bombs, hack and sack board. The McDonald's in the Southwest Motor Inn in Houston, Texas. All uh, fatal line of duty fires uh, most of them without a, a, a lot of indication of fire uh, in the building itself, in that Fort Lee bowling alley. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that we've all had fires, uh, infamous fires, either because we did a great job or what I'm going to relate here shortly is a horrible, horrible mistake that I made and it's only through the Lord having his hands on our, my shoulder that we didn't uh, end up in the burn center. And it would have been my fault. But Chief Halton, can you, uh, can you give us some insight into a, uh, a memorable or infamous fire you had in an attic or a cock walk? Yeah. Um, so attics are interesting things. Cock walks are interesting things. And so you have to remember that depending on the structure you're talking about, the variety is extensive. And so in part of the country you were talking about. So attics generally are built to contain, uh, create a space to protect the interior of a structure, but they're also designed to bring uh, air into that space so that it helps to remove things like mold and things like that. So when, when, our, 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 when Dan was talking about people showing the plywood up to the corners, that's probably a good thing because then it would stop that airflow from going up and doing what that attic is designed to do in the first place. Because without that, you can't have the cooling properties and you can't have the dissipation of mold and other things that the attic's designed to do. So it's got other functions other than just keeping the rain out. And so when we talk about attics, we have some attics that are basically unaccessible because they're so small. And now we have attics that with modern construction, especially in the residential sector, that are subdivided into semi-concealed and unconcealed spaces. So you may have an attic, an attic that you may have a pitch on on, a, on the average home that's got five and six different pitches on one home. And so the old standard attic that we had in our, our modeling would show you one, you know, pitch. It was the old standard, one, one standard pitch. And, and, and that was great. Maybe a pull down door and things like that. So the first thing to think about is what kind of attic are you dealing with? What kind of cock lock are you dealing with? Does it have fire curtains? Do you see any firewalls on the outside of the building? And sometimes you'll see an, uh, a protrusion that comes up that's not a true firewall. You got to know, is that a true firewall or do I have a cock lock that runs this entire uh, you know, space? And which is very common in these modern uh, strip centers where they, there's just no, there's just no break whatsoever. Right? So we had a, a strip mall fire, uh, years ago, this is going back probably 20 years plus, but basically it had gotten up into the, the cock lock of the strip mall. And, and I, I know there's a lot of discussion about pushing fire and not pushing fire and all that that goes along with it. But anytime you introduce air and you push air with your streams, you know, you're going to be driving that air and the products of combustion and the heat and whatnot. And actually, you know, this gets into fine detail about you're not actually pushing the fire itself, but if you're pushing the superheated gases that in turn ignite when they hit you know, substances that are also off-gassing, uh, you know, it's a, the fine line. It's the, it's tomato, tomato, potato, potato, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, we, we got, we got into this strip mall and we started off, you know, I'm, I'm going to say we were on probably on the A, we were on, on that A C side and we, we were able to push that son of a gun all the way around and we met ourselves about three hours later, um, you know, because th th that that cock loft had no fire stopping in it whatsoever. I mean, it's as if the term had never been heard, but the code required it. And so it, it's interesting. Oftentimes the folks, when they're building things, you know, they get ahead of the inspectors 
or they say they're going to do something and then it never happens. So there were no curtains, there were no separations, there were nothing. But we had anticipated them based on our previous experiences. And so it kind of it kind of caught us unaware. The problem with that is even when you're doing a building inspection, oftentimes, how do you get into some of those spaces, right? So you almost have to have eyes on some of these buildings as they're going up. And the ones that already exist, man, it's so tough to keep up with. And I know, you know, we've got bits and we've got know before you go and we've got all these great programs out there. But the, you know, we're all real world guys and gals here. You know, we're not, we, we don't talk about, we made a, we do a lot of communication on the side while we're talking to y'all. And I quoted Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra had a great line. He said, they tell me in theory it should work in practice and practice it doesn't. And, and to Dan's point, we need SOPs, we need SOGs so that we understand, you know, the lessons learned. We, we, we've got some basic parameters to operate in, but you always got to be expecting the unexpected and, and you always got to be anticipating and you always got to be assuming the worst, right? You know, always assume the worst. And if it doesn't have to be the worst, you know, and you overreact, you can always draw back. If you if you want to react, it's hard to grow. You know, like um, when Dugan started that mustache, it looked really good. Now it's just silly. So I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? You got to, you, you got to, you got to start. A, Hiddle, don't you laugh. You got a baseball mustache. There's nine players on each side. It's unbelievable. So anyway, enough fun and games. But the, we had that, we, that it was a great learning experience for us on my job that day uh, about cock loss and, and common spaces. And then even in the ones that do have good firewalls, you always got to be careful because, you know, if somebody puts in a, a new heating and air conditioning unit or if they got to do a plumbing job or something, they can breach holes in that. And, and a lot of those guys don't even know that they got to plug those holes back up. So you may have a firewall, but it could have a, it could have a hole the size of a, you know, basketball or bigger in it that, that a tremendous amount of heat and energy can get through. So that was our experience. Um, and, 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 and in the jurisdiction I work in now, roof, roof, roofs on residentials are, are insane. And then we've got a huge proliferation of rain roofs. And, and sometimes they remove, you know, the old uh, roof and sometimes they don't. And uh, so it's, it's fascinating. It's a great topic. Uh, you know, we could talk for three days on attic fires and cock loss, but thank you. Okay, well, let's talk about rain roofs for a minute. I just happen to have. Uh, now, anytime you have an addition, you essentially have a rain roof because you have a date. Because this, can you see it? Okay. See the picture? Okay. Yeah, you can see it, Bill. Pull it back that... a little bit so they can see the shingles where the new uh, rafter. Yeah, there you go. All right. Perfect. All right. Now let's go to the next one here. That's what it looks like underneath that overlap. Okay. Now there's two size ups at every fire. I'm in there pulling the ceiling, looking at the underside of the roof. And the chief is saying, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Now this one was done for aesthetics. The original roof line is right here. Okay. This is the dangerous concealed space. That is the finished roof line. Imagine the void space you have in there. Okay. Uh, the other point I wanted to uh, reinforce that you were talking about, uh, Chief Bobby, is um, your pre-fire planning or when the building is under construction. One of the most important details is the overhang mansard, if you want to call it that, the cornice. Is it an integral part of the roof structure? Are the roof rafters or trusses, in this case, cantilevered over the exterior walls, or is that a bolt-on? Is it a bolt-on? Is it just there as a facade? Very important. Uh, that's a kind of a detail. Um, we're going to get to your... Uh, Sam, are you going to come on, or are you just going to be, like, uh, hiding around in the, in the, uh, in the bushes there? Because we're getting these comments from the peanut gallery from uh, Sam Hiddle, but uh, I've yet to see him. So, um, Sam, st uh, Sam, stand up, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dave Walsh. Oh, don't encourage us. <laughs> okay, all right. I want to, uh, Dave has done some excellent research on uh, the hazards of lightweight construction. 
and um, the comparison of legacy dimensional lumber, two by six, two by eight rafters, tongue and groove, wood decking, uh, the type of roof you could be on and with a fire raging right underneath you and you'd be relatively safe as compared to a, a the construction we see today. And what the, the uh, and I, I know this has got to be the case in Fairfax County, where you could go to a fire in the morning in a house that was built in the late 40s or 50s, and it's built like, <coughs> like a tank, okay? Uh, it's all dimension heavy-duty lumber. And then go in the afternoon and have totally different lightweight truss construction. And to enhance it, enhance the dead load, they put concrete or terracotta tiles. Um, so, Professor, would you, maybe you could show your videos and explain a little bit about what your research has been doing. Uh, first, just to introduce, or to uh, kind of introduce the video, when the, the students do it, when in my last life, when we were at the Fire Science Program, every semester, the students as the club would, would put together some sort of theory or something they wanted to, the test and they use incident command and put it all together. And the, the one when we first did the trust video, which surprised the heck out of us, it was kind of a, uh, I remember back uh, John Mittendorf way back when did a trust test out in LA County. I think it was so long ago that it was on 16 millimeter film and he did that and then pressed us. So what we tried to do was uh, mimic that. So let's see if we can get that to come up and play. There we go. Getting close. Okay. All right, this was the, um, the stick belt. What we did was, um, we went to our architect folks and said, well, tell us something that's kind of comparable to what we had done with the trusses. So two by sixes, this is 16 feet left to right, four feet deep. So stick built, we got uh, roof rafters every 16 inches. We put 300 pounds of weight up on top, which is about 10% of what code says that roof should, should carry. And as we pointed out to the students and everybody, this wasn't a a scientific test in the fact that we used hay and pallets and it had all the oxygen in the world. But if you look at this thing, our fire load started burning out uh, pretty quickly. Um, a lot of the roof sheathing had burned through and that's in fact what ended up being the, the weak link. We used, I believe, half inch plywood. So 21 minutes later, some sort of frame was still standing, standing in place. Now, Now with the trusses, and this is actually the one we did first, again, 16 by four. Now being trusses, we've got them two feet on center, again, about 300 pounds. Uh, it takes off, and the one thing that the students were aware of, again, like we said, hay and pallets, but this wood was was fairly new. We'd gone to a home center, bought it, put it, so it still had a, a fairly high moisture content in there. Uh, and we had six video cameras set up here, hoping to actually catch a gusset plate fail. And Mr. Murphy's law, plugged into play. If you look at the one at about the 10 o'clock position, that's the one we didn't have a camera on. And at five minutes to the second, that's what turned around and failed. And we just replicate that to kind of really drive it home. Yeah. Can I say something before we go to the next video? Absolutely. I've had uh, people say, well, you know, that's not going to be the case because the, the trusses are going to collapse on non-load bearing partitions and they're going to be load bearing and uh, you'll be underneath the uh, collapsed roof. <laughs> not with a modern design, you're not, because the only partitions are the bathrooms and the bedroom. You've got a wide open area. If that thing comes down, you're in deep trouble. The other thing that is very uh, telling about that, uh, Dave, is how quickly the fire takes possession of the trusses because of their surface in relation to their mass. It's like kindling wood. How quickly the fire takes possession of the, uh, the uh, 
uh, structural members. Uh, did you have another one for us? I do. I just want, want to oh, add that. Hold on, uh, guys. I'm sorry. This is too A lot of us have turned into attic quarters. Um, my wife can't hear me, so I can say this now, but I think we have our children's first diapers and second diapers. And, and you know, we put all this fire load and you look at, like Bill, you said, the large surface to mass ratio of the exposed wood. Then we put dozens, if not hundreds of cardboard boxes in there sitting on top of oriented strand board or plywood or whatever. And then if that's not enough, uh, we turn around and during the warmer weather, we let it just sit up there and bake and just get drier and drier and drier and drier. And then along comes an ignition source, whether the mouse eats through the wire or whatever happens or the fire extends up from down below to a kitchen van or bathroom van or whatever. And, you know, you look at attics are just, uh, not that's the intention, but they're, they're really built to, to burn. Okay, uh, Tammy, uh, when we have technical difficulties on TV, they usually say it's time for a commercial. So. Um, while you're doing that, can I go ahead and give a shout out to our uh, sponsor? You most certainly can. Okay. Our sponsor is Key Hose. That's keyhose.com. You will not find better hose. They have uh, different grades, different varieties. Obviously, their top of the line is going to be their combat ready. Again, take the key challenge. You cannot kink this hose. And uh, if you are a disciple of the Cleveland load or the coil load, which I am not because you can't stretch it dry, but, you know, there's a, so many people that love it. So I can't change everybody's mind. OK, I'm not an evangelist. So if you're going to use that type of load, you better have hose that is inherently kink resistant because you, especially in a standpipe operation, because you've got two things going against you. You've got, but if I was half as good looking as Sam, I would want the world to see my face. Yeah, but he's got a, Hey, he's got a mask on right now. So he's not spreading the virus. So you only see part of his face. Okay? And then when you consider the baseball hat, you hardly see any of his exposed skin. So that's not going to, that's not going to fly. Again, uh, if you're in the market for new hose, take a look at the Key Combat Ready and their True ID two and a half and two and a quarter hose. Um, are we ready with that insulation video, Tammy? Yeah, could I, uh, could I ask something really quick? Yeah, and, and oh, Sam, yeah. 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 since you're on, brother, bring up the, the issue about the uh, gable attack in the gusset plate, please. Okay. Uh, well, what I wanted to ask Dave real quick was, um, I noticed at the end of the video, the uh, the walls kick out. So um, I, I think that that's a, a caveat to what happens is when we do have failures and we have those walls pushed. Um, again, I'm not trying to get into the weeds, but I think that's an interesting piece of that um, failure that uh, didn't get mentioned. Um, with that said, um, we, we can come back to the gable thing because I don't want to uh, get off after the installation video. Does that sound all right, Captain? Okay, you can come back to that. Uh, are we ready with that video, Tammy? Sam, I had a little trouble hearing you, bro. Can you can you up your audio at all, buddy? Well, it might have just been me, but I, I could I could barely hear you, man. Does that help? Up. He's far away. There you go, uh, Chief Halton. You brought up a, 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 about action and the intensity of fire. You're not hitting the fire. What you're hitting is a converging roof line or an AC unit. You're going to have to move and go someplace else. So, um, you know, Phil, if I can interrupt for a second, Dan, yeah. Dan, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, your, your attic story, because I think it's really relevant to your conversation about converging. Go ahead, Dan. So I've heard this before. It's a great story. Yeah. So, um, yeah. The story Chief told me, this fire probably, uh, God, it's probably been over, over 10 years ago, but it came out as a, a medical local or just an engine medic. Uh, it, it started progressing over the, the four or five minutes of the units getting there to, it was a motorcycle on fire, and that was a result of the wreck in, in a cul-de-sac. And ultimately cul culminated with uh, the engine showing up with the medic unit and indeed finding uh, a victim who was burnt, a motorcycle that was indeed on fire, but it was on fire on the backside underneath of a deck of a two-story single-family dwelling with a peaked roof with an attached garage. Uh, and so, you know, the unit 
did everything they're supposed to. They laid a gutter line because it wasn't an engine coming in. So they ran a line directly to the to the hydrant. They called for the appropriate resources, but now that whole box alarm coming is delayed because you know that they're right there on the scene of the fire, and the fire had burned up the back side of the house on the Charlie side, working towards the Bravo corner, went directly across the um, garage, and obviously the end of each one of these peak roofs on the Bravo and Delta side is the uh, soffit or the um, the gable and vent. So the fire went right in that gable and vent. And so this captain, well, very well experienced, did everything to a T, right? Grabbed the patient, threw him back to the medic unit. Medic unit's gone. Tells his probationary firefighter, stretch a line around the side Charlie and get a water on that fire. And in the meantime, a second line gets stretched to the front door. So the, the, the course of action is take the line around the back, hit this fire, knock it down. It's, we know it's in the attic. Let's let's make the push into the attic. So at the time, I was uh, driving to the chief, and we got there pretty pretty early. Uh, we were the second or third unit on the scene before any more suppression units. And when I got out of the rig, you know, my boss told me, "Hey, I want you to take uh, go around side, Charlie. Give me a report from back there, and I might keep you back there because we have some more units coming in, obviously." And what I could see was that the fire had reignited on the Charlie side, so they knocked it down, but it started burning again, and that. The Bravo side gable and vent was just chugging smoke out of it. And I see the hose lines going through the front door. It was a wide open stairwell. They went up the circular stairwell to the top of the uh, steps. And it's overlooking the entire foyer. The captain has a howl in his hand, looks at the probe. He has a nozzle. There's a backup man right there. He says, you ready? Yep. He pokes a hole through the ceiling. And about that time was when I was walking to the front door. And I heard the front door slam shut, which was unusual because there was no one else in the fire ground. And about an instant later, I see every window in the house goes orange. And the next thing I th see is three firefighters all out the front door. One's unconscious. The other one is convinced he has something impaled in his chest. And the other one is you know, just really not there with it, con you know, concussion. And when you walked into the house, it, it, the end result was what happened is they had a low order CO explosion. So this fire had burned, pumping the CO, pumping the smoke into this attic space, just accumulating and building and building and building, and no place for it to go. And like all fires, it's just looking for oxygen. And as gentlemen, we show up and you know, follow the course of action. Because it wasn't a truck on the scene or another unit that had made any other openings, this was a singular opening. And as soon as he poked a hole through the ceiling, this thing had a violent reaction. And it blew down everything into the second floor and first floor. And it was such a violent, you know, a ball of fire that it burned all the paintings on the first floor, melted all the paintings, melted the curtains on it. And when you looked at the walls, it looked like a stake. You could see where all the two by fours were seared into the drywall. Uh, and fortunately for these guys, you know, Fairfax County luck, they, they had got blown off the railing into the foyer, didn't fall into a room on fire, we're right by the front door and we're able to go right out the front door. But it was an eye opener for us that, hey, look, while it was an incredible event, it was still the fire triangle. I mean, the fire was looking for oxygen. We introduced it. Its reaction to it happened, didn't, happened to be very violent. So it was really, uh, it, it was an eye opening situation for us because it wasn't a one off. It, it could happen again. And it really stressed to the point of what you're talking about, Bill, is like, you know, you got to be cognizant of what we teach back in Firefighter One. Locate the fire, confine, compartment, extinguish, and figure out where that fire is. Now, what's the best way for us to attack it? And when something's off, like, i.e., there's not a truck, you know, we're fortunate with our staffing that the trucks and the rescues are all there at the same time, that that thing would probably have been vented a little bit easier before that hose line was in place and multiple hose lines. But in this case, it wasn't. And you know, we saw that violent reaction of a low order CO explosion. And the reason that, if I could just interject once, and I'm going to bring Clark and, and Sam into this because I know they, they're looking at this um, phenomena that Dan was just describing so well from a kind of a, a research standpoint. I know Clark is interested in this and Sam is because if you look at Precious Space Tabernacle, where the three firefighters got killed in Texas, if you look at the Southwest supermarket, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the Sufa Superstore, all of those fires, although different kinds of occupancies in the residential one Dan just described, it's that same phenomena, right? That little introduction of air, and then suddenly that incredibly violent uh, reaction, and, and sometimes zero visibility, 
you know, complete obstruction of, of all our visibility. And then what Dan described is that really bad, bad deal where, uh, you know, it, it's a, and I don't know how we'll ever be able to, from a research standpoint, because they are so violent to be able to reproduce it. So I just want to bring, I, I, sorry to interrupt Bill, but you know, cockloffs and, and, and attic fires are, are so deadly. They're just so deadly. And, and Dave's stuff was great to show how, you know, roof structures and flooring structure are so unpredictable and, and dangerous. But to, to Sam and Clark, who I know are really interested in, 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 the, in fire behavior phenomena, what are your thoughts about what Dan just shared and, and, and those other fires that had similar phenomena? And I just had to hear it from these guys for a second, if you don't mind. Uh, I think you know, that, for, go ahead, Sam. I, I, just, I think it actually uh, kind of uh, goes back to the research in general. Um, the research kind of gives us finite um, measurements of what's actually happening and helps us observe it in a more detailed manner when we start using stuff like thermocouplers. But when we go back to the rudimentary um, assessment of things, we've always understood this. Um, Captain Dugan can uh, probably testify to this, but is that not the reason they called it the coffin cut? Is they figured that was an adequate vent to let some of that stuff out before crews got underneath it and opened it up. Clark? Sam, um, you are correct on that. I'm sorry. I to, you are correct. Um, we've been trained in uh, Clark County that you enter a building, you open the front door. First thing you do before you advance is you pull ceiling above your head inside the doorway. That's how we've been trained for years. And that's how I was trained. And that's still how they're training the academy. Turns out now, if you're not ready to have an aggressive firefight inside that attic, then we are doing that wrong. Am I correct? I mean, we are now pulling a chunk down and we could be oxygenating a fire that is completely on the other side of the building, but we still train our probationary firefighters that you enter a room and you pull ceiling down to make sure there is no fire above your head. So bad, bad tactic. Uh, truck companies in Clark County, we only have five truck companies. We have 31 engines and five truck companies. Um, that's just, that's just what we have. All right. So the truck is going to be delayed. Ideally, I would like to have a truck on a roof, cutting a hole, ventilating that stuff up and out, as opposed to going down inside the structure. That would be ideal situation. We don't always get that. Uh, like I said, 31 engines, we get engine companies on scene very, very quickly. And we've got some great, uh, aggressive, <clears throat> great aggressive engine companies. They get the door open, they get in and they start fighting fire long before the trucks even on scene. So we've got a situation. We've got a situation. We are putting men in harm's way, the way we are tactically fighting fires in Clark County. Well, I think this type of device here is underutilized. Uh, I think that we can take advantage of the lack of ventilation, uh, which is causing a ventilation limited fire and a high production of carbon uh, monoxide, as Dan was relating. Uh, what we're actually doing by pulling ceiling under an oxygen deficient fire is opening up the uh, damper of a wood burning stove and will precipitate a, some type of violent fire event. Now, I don't think we're using this enough. I'm going to ask Captain Mike about, uh, I've been hearing good things about your cockloft nozzle. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the FDNY's indigenous cockloft nozzle? Well, Bill, the cockloft nozzle is just a way to get water quickly into the cockloft. Okay, it's a great tool, but it's another tool. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know where the fire is. And very honestly, you know, pulling the ceilings and having a guy stand on a, a table or a bed or something to get up in there, and we're not getting it throughout the entire cockloft. We get guys up on the roof. We cut a hole in the roof. Let's put the water in there. Why are we pulling it and allowing it to blow back down on the guys? We have had guys killed with the um, with attics being blown down and things like that, with rapid fire development because of an oxygen starts fire. Again, we need to have an idea of how we're going to get water on this. Okay, if we're just opening and again, early on in my career, I was told you go into a room, you poke a hole in the ceiling, you look, just like Clark said. And that's fine. But the problem is now, if you don't have a way to put that fire out and you're feeding it oxygen, that's not, a, if you don't have a charged hose line there, there's something wrong. You need a nozzle. You need a way to get water into that space. The cockloft nozzle is just like a distributor 
a cellar nozzle. And I see other places that are out there. I love a place I know up on me, a small department, that they go to these attached senior complexes. And they use the piercing nozzle. The fire is reported in unit four. They go to unit three and unit two. And if there is a fire in there and it's any way gone up, they take a piercing nozzle and go right through the soffit into the attic space to prevent it from going out. And I'm like, that's brilliant. It's brilliant. You have to have a way to get water on the fire before you start opening it up and feeding it the oxygen. Mike, I asked you on a phone conversation we had the other day. Have you, do you know of anybody using the cockloft nozzle from below through an opening in a small, small opening in a ceiling? Not that I have seen yet, because I think we have, we have used it up above. If you're going to have using something from below, I think they're going to use a nozzle and put a, uh, okay. open up a small hole, put a nozzle in there, put some water and spread it out. You're going to, you know, try to get in there. But again, you're going to have to, that's going to be a quick hit. And then you're going to have to open up a bigger hole so you can now use the water to move the water around, to map where you want that water to go. Now, okay. Captain Gustin, real quick. Yes. So you're using the piercing nozzle from below because you don't want to introduce any air into that yeah. attic space, right? You want to provide water but no air, correct? That is correct. And we're taking advantage of two things, the heat and the confinement. Now, one problem I have is – uh, we don't have any lath and plaster in Las Vegas. So everything is sheetrock screwed to, to trusses underneath. Every time I've put water inside of an attic, we've dropped tons of sheetrock down. As soon as you get that insulation wet, as soon as you get that sheetrock wet, we've got four by eight sheets of sheetrock coming down on top of us. So, you know, it's going to come down eventually. I don't know if you, I've, I've never used the piercing nozzle from underneath, but um, anytime I've even poked a small hole and put a hose line up there, we drop huge sheets of sheetrock down into the house and we've now uh, ventilated the fire. So have you, do you have a different experience than I do? Well, I mean, that, that is, that is a, a strong possibility. Uh, we have more robust ceilings than you do. In fact, they're neck breakers. Um, and I'm going to show you one here shortly uh, that we run into. So some of those nozzles, Clark, just to, just to, to kind of a little point of clarification, you can get some that actually will mist almost, and they generally run about 90 gallons a minute. So, you know, and, and this is going to sound stupid, but it's almost like a transitional cock loft attack or attic attack to where you're just trying to get, you know, some humidity in there to, to maybe calm those gases to buy you a, 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 an opening. But I agree. I've done the same thing, Clark. I've, I've dropped more drywall on my head than I care to remember because, you know, we got water up in the attic. That's why Sam used to be 6'1". <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Bill, can I add one thing to that? Because I think we'd be remiss if we don't really uh, hit it. It's like, it comes back to when we're talking about this, and I'm just thinking from you know, my perspective of what I'm relying upon that small unit leader who arrives on the call is so vitally important for our company officers to diagnose, figure out where the fire is. And, you know, that, that is the, the on-scene report that's taken that lap that has given good knowledge of your building construction, knowing you, where your, your office, uh, where you're going to go operate, what exact, where is that fire located? Can you know where your balloon frame construction houses are and say, hey, I, it's still in the attic, but I think it's in the basement versus, hey, this is all modern construction here. I think it's there. And, and to that point is, is don't always think you have to go through the front door to fight fire. You know, one of the things we try to train on is, hey, if you recognize, because we love to fight fire on the level, we don't like going down basement stairs, we don't like going up into the attic, I'd like to fight a fire at it level. So if you are, if you train on it, and you know you pull up and you got the staffing, hey, if I can get a ladder quickly to the gable one vent, rip that thing open, get some water in there, and then have a coordinated attack to, to keep it all up in the attic space, I can do it. And that comes from practice, recognition, and practice. Because I go to the same thing we talk about piercing nozzles. Because I can tell you, we carry some on our rigs. And I, when I would do station inspections, that's one of the things I would ask our people is, where's your piercing nozzle? And I get that look like the, the what? You mean the thing we never, ever pull out and we never trained on? So what do you think the measure of success is if a captain goes, go get the piercing nozzle, and we're going to go put it in the attic space? When it gets to the third house and it's burned it all the way down because you're still trying to put the piercing nozzle on, 
you know, that idea kind of goes away. So I think it really does come down to that early part of recognition. Where is the fire? And then what have you trained on? And what can you execute in a short amount of time on a chaotic fire ground? Um, hey, did we, before we go any further, Dave, do you have your, your uh, insulation video? I do. Okay. See if okay. I, I don't want to blow up uh, Tammy's system again. Let's see. Real quick background on this. We were doing some other demos and we just uh, took some, I think it was one inch of the polystyrene foam um, and just put them on the, the walls, put some hay. I think we had a little stuffed chair there um, and we lit it on fire and really were kind of impressed. That fire to the right was from another demo we had just done. We were telling the guys earlier when we did this, back to the back left, there's a, the training tower in the county. And there was another department up there training. They were between evolutions. And normally the wind in this area comes from what would be the far left here. Well, today that wind decides to shift once we get going and totally in a matter of seconds envelop that tower in thick, black, nasty, extremely toxic smoke and made some very unhappy firefighters. Now, Dave, according to my calculations, I've seen this video before, there's only about 77 square feet of one inch polystyrene in the structure, correct? Yes. 77 square feet. We wrap entire X, the houses are completely wrapped in this in Las Vegas. So we're talking thousands and thousands of square feet of this material on houses. And this video is only showing 77 square feet. Yeah. Now in the habitable space code supposed to say it's protected by something. Uh, this stuff, uh, somebody mentioned decomposing and off-gassing, it starts giving off hydrogen cyanide at 212 degrees and then doesn't catch fire to a lot later. So it's, it can kill us way before we even see smoke. And, and look at that in a matter of no time at all. And again, if the video would panned up, we blacked out the sky. Um, and, and like uh, Clark says, 77 square feet, one inch, the fire was kind of burned out fairly quickly, but you imagine with all this heat and smoke, if it was encapsulated in a structure, what it would have done. Dave, Mark, have you, seen you brought up something really, really interesting, and it has to do with what the foamed insulation is, are bubbles, okay? But not necessarily air bubbles. Hmm. When we look at this kind of sprayed on foam insulation, this goes, this is poly uh, isocyanurate, okay? Um, and you mentioned something I did not know about this, this, uh, this devil is that unlike a lot of insulation that has air as the blowing agent or forms the bubble, this has what, according to you? This was nitrogen styrens, things like that use air and they're about 90, 98% air in your typical polystyrene, whereas polyisocyanurate uses nitrogen as its insulating medium. So, um, yeah, the nitrogen, when you burn nitrogen, it produces large quantities of hydrogen cyanide. And just, uh, I don't know if you guys remember that when we used to kill people with gas chambers, it was hydrogen cyanide that we used to use to pump into the gas chamber to kill human beings. So this is what's released when, uh, when this product is burned. And it's, that's the latest polyisocyanurate. It's the latest and greatest. It's the most expensive. So typically you're going to find the polystyrenes, that white stuff that Dave showed in his video. That's still what we're using most of just because it's uh, cost prohibitive to use the polyisocyanurate. You're usually going to find that product on roofs where you require the highest amount of insulation. You're not going to find polyisocyanurate on walls or interior walls, anything like that. But uh, yeah, it is extremely, extremely toxic nasty smoke our engineers have to mask up uh, especially in palm beach counties and high-end houses in fact in florida that is so efficient in insulation there are no attic soffit vents that is a completely conditioned um space now can anybody identify this stuff right here A long day. <laughs> and you will and you will come back for a repeat. You know, the, the sign of a satisfied customer is they call you back. They, they want to do business again. So, so Dave, yeah, let's, that's a great idea. Let's grind up newspaper and cardboard boxes. And fellas, the words green 
and sustainable are not our friends. I just talked to James Johnson about that a little while ago. Um, they're not our friends. Uh, can we go through the panel? I want to know, do you have that type of blown in cellular? By the way, the R value is better than, than fiberglass, but it has a propensity to smolder, rekindle. Everybody that has it has had a nightmare rekindle with this. Clark, do you have it in your area? Yes, I do. We do have that quite a bit and not only a long day, but some very unhappy customers because you have to pull every single bit of ceiling down and you have to completely wet that stuff. And the house is a complete disaster. When we leave, we show up the fire, you know, the fire does $25,000 worth of damage and the fire department shows up and we do $75,000 worth of damage. I hear you, brother. How about you, uh, Professor Dave? Um, up in Ira, they've got all sorts of stuff. Uh, the economy, when that stuff came out in the beginning, that was the latest and the greatest. So people got it. So, I mean, you don't know till you walk through the front door. Yeah. And, and if you're not sure, I teach in the officer development class, take a handful of this stuff. Well, like Sam, he would be inclined to take a road flare and go up into the attic and see if it's combustible. I wouldn't do that. Don't do what Sam does. Take a handful of this stuff and go out and show the homeowner. Hey, we have a problem. That means the homeowner and the fire officer. How about you, Captain Mike? You ever run into this horrible stuff? All the time, Bill. Blown in, uh, older buildings, the price of uh, heating oil goes through the roof, and then they put it up on the top, uh, on the top of a five or six story building, and they've got ceiling fixtures, fires in there all the time. They don't protect the electric. Happens all the time. Uh, Dan. Oh, yeah, unequivocally. And we, we've had a rash of these recently where, um, you know, we're just trying to figure out the best solution to Clark's point where we don't have to take down your entire ceiling. And there, there really is not a better solution. I mean, it, we've had one where the guys were up there, they thought they had the fire knocked down, checked me with a thermal imager several times, strong gust of wind doing the attic what it's supposed to be doing, introducing air, and then woof, you know, it just takes yeah. off. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it, it and we even tried it years ago, one of those vacuum trucks, you know, use it for that. And it created such a such a static electric charge that we're like, yeah, no, no good. It's better to do manual labor. You so set the truck on fire, too? So you pulled hot embers <laughs> into the vacuum truck and he drove away and went back to the yard? As long as not yours, right? That's what I think. Are you still with us, Chief Bobby? Right here, Uncle Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great story. I want to give a shout out to my friend, Chris Ackerman, young, sharp battalion chief. Comes in on an attic fire and the first arriving company returned the rest of the responding companies. My chief went in and he's got a carbon monoxide detector on his uh, radio strap. And the thing keeps sounding. There's not a wisp of smoke anywhere that the thing keeps sounding. Carbon monoxide, a product of incomplete combustion wear in the cellulose insulation, someplace, somewhere. And I think it was you, Clark, that said, oh, my God, the homeowner was furious with the fire department. You're wrecking my house. He kept saying that until like 30 feet away from the point of origin of the fire. They pop a hole and down comes the flaming insulation. Hey, are we good to keep going for uh, a few more minutes? Well, you're the boss. That's good with me. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes, you Sam may, Hill. Bill. Pardon me? I said, yes, you may. <laughs> okay. Sam, what about the cellulose insulation? Yeah, exact same thing. Um, unprotected electrical. Last time we dealt with it, um, we got called out for um, – one spot we we dealt with it we couldn't get the smoke to go away um we couldn't see it with the thermal imager from the top which is no surprise um had to walk around the house we had to wait for some of that uh, saturation to get through the uh, ceiling components so it was visible to the thermal imager and we ended up finding four different spot fires and had to remove the entire ceiling yeah it jumps from one to the next uh sam you've got to talk to us about your, your uh, experiences with hitting a fire through the gabled end in the gusset plates. All right. And I, this, but I think it's, 
report. You know me, being the plagiarizing bastard that I am, there will be an article in Fire Engineering next month about it. I build up. Tell us just means you're a real firefighter. You, you know how you do it. You're like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And then tomorrow it's your idea. Exactly right, brother. Well, um, tell us about this. I think it's now, if just, uh, if, if you Wait a second. Can... If you steal from one other guy, it's research. <laughs> um, basically, if you look at the physics of the truss, um, we can lose those gusset plates as long as everything's still a compression system. So the, uh, the wood members, it can sit on top of each other um, without that gusset plate, and that's fine. But when we try to do a gable attack on like an apartment building or something like that, and we put the trucks up and we run master streams, now what happens is we have that truss with that member coming down and those master streams, when it starts to knock those members sideways, now we actually lose the structural integrity of that roof. You're talking about the web members? Yes. Okay. Never heard about it? Uh, excellent point. Sam, what do you think about this here? What, what about this? We were operating a master stream through a hole that is burnt in a roof that I do believe was designed to, this is my department by default, designed to shed water. Yeah, I think uh, I've never seen the sky catch on fire. I'm okay, okay with the fire coming up and out. How about this, Sam? Would this be more effective? Uh, let me see. Let me pin the video. Um, what's yeah, that going through? I can't really tell. It is. Can you rest you guys see it? It's wire, lath, and plaster. It is an absolute bear to pull. So we put our elevated master stream, not from above, but into the top four windows and impinge that stream and hydraulically blast through the, the drywall, or the, uh, not drywall, the wire lap and plaster. Um, this is something that we've, uh, I've been jonesing to do this for years. Jonesing for, with a rain roof, jonesing to put our Bresden distributor basement pipe on the end of our ladder pipe. Now remember, we're, we're dealing with a short wheel base rig that's basically an engine, okay, with a 60 foot area. So we put that thing on there. If you've got the proper pitch, it's not gonna work every time, but if you can get up there and either chop a hole, you have to do it carefully, or there's already a hole burnt through the roof, which is usually the case, uh, run that Bresman. Now, the reason no. you can see the reason you can see this is Clark, what you said. How long you think a ceiling is going to hold up when that thing's flowing over 250 gallons a minute? Yeah, absolutely. You're going to lower your ceiling, but you will put that. Uh, and if it's a rain roof, well, I mean, you know, I mean, you could collapse the roof. There's no doubt about it. You're putting a lot of weight in there, but um, we've used this. We've used Bresnans from above and below. Your concern about collapsing a ceiling is a real concern. The great all. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, and I gotta tell you, fellas, I just heard Chicago the other day had um, uh, some firefighters hurt with the ceiling collapse. And I have to think it had to have been, I could fellas, this is, Wire lath and plaster. Okay, it's a, the, the wire lath is the is the your metal lath is the substrate, and this stuff is heavy. But what's scary is, really, what is holding this up are just these two one by three furring strips that are nailed to the bottom of the trusses. So you've got this massive, heavy ceiling, and you better be pulling that ceiling from a doorway where you. It, of the fire room or at the front door, because this thing's going to come down. Now, this is totally unnecessary. Now, we've got buildings with an exterior hallway. I know that you've got them uh, clubbed. Well, just about everybody's got a Motel 6 with outside hallways. To beat yourself up trying to pull that, when in fact the whole thing could come down at one time. If it is an integral part of the roof structure, go inside. This is West Palm Beach, Florida. 
I'm holding it the wrong way. Let me see here. Yeah, that's it. All right. That is all wire lap. So Captain Lewis knew what was going to happen. So they go inside of an apartment. They put four guys on two 12-foot pike poles, and they pull that bad boy down. And it came down like a row of dominoes, and I've seen that. And it really, it's, the question is, is it necessary for us to pull sockets? If, if the eave, the soffit, of course, is on the bottom of the eave. If the eave is an extension of the roof structure, why is it necessary to pull that? Wouldn't it be easier to operate in the inside? Clark, you had a, a ripping fire the other day in an attic, didn't you? I uh, wasn't really ripping in the fire in the attic, Cap. We, uh, we got a good stop on it. But, uh, again, uh, you know, speaking to what I spoke about, you know, dropping ceilings, uh, it was a beautiful house. There was two houses. The front house was 7,000 square foot mansion. And behind the guest house was a 3,000 square foot guest house set 400 feet back from the, from the street. Beautiful, beautiful houses. So we had a report of a fire in the back house. We showed up and it was some garbage on the side of the house that uh, burned up and into the rafter tails and into the attic. So I was on the outside division. We knocked down the, uh, um, we knocked down all the fire in the garbage and we started putting water in the rafter tails. I put my head in. I saw the house is absolutely beautiful inside. And the people were just making dinner. They had about a dozen people at the house, beautiful meal, all set out right at dinner time. So next company comes in. He's a free captain, a friend of mine. I said, Hey, you got to get inside, but look at the house. It's a beautiful house. Be careful. And he knew exactly what I was talking about. So he got in there and he figured out where exactly to pull ceiling and he just pulled one truss out. So like 16 inches, he pulled it out, put a little bit of water in there. We had a lot of smoke staining on the wood, but no, no real uh, alligator or anything like that. So we stopped it right there. And so he was very, very uh, used a lot of discipline in putting water on side that, that uh, inside that attic. Um, so then we showed up and said, Hey, let's overhaul this house. You know, these people are just getting ready to eat. So we, we cleaned everything out. It was very little damage that we caused very little damage. So we got all the she rock out. We got all the wet insulation out. We, we squeegeed it out case closed. So I'm talking to the homeowner and said, okay, here's what happened. This is what we think happened. And I hear smell before, before they pulled ceiling, they took all of the dinner and they pushed the dining room table up into the kitchen, pull, push it out of the way. So all the, everything was pushed into the kitchen. So I'm talking to the homeowner about this and this and this and this, and you should be able to have the house back. And then boom, this thing hits and the whole house shook. And I knew exactly what happened. I, I said, excuse me, folks. And I walked and I put my head inside the house. We dropped like a hundred square feet of, uh, of she rock fell and it happened to fall right where we pushed all these people's dinner, fell right inside the kitchen and smashed everything. I grabbed the captain. He's a good captain. He saw it. I said, how much water did you put in that attic? I told you, be careful. And he said, very, very little. We put very, very little water up in that attic. So we just cooled the wood and that little bit of water was enough to drop all that sheetrock down. Made a huge mess of the house. Smashed, destroyed the kitchen, destroyed all the dinner. Uh, it was absolutely embarrassing. It was embarrassing after I was so proud of the work we did to salvage and overhaul this, this house properly and protect these people properly. We made a giant mess. So, oh, Clark. Tell me about the driveways. Why can't you drive an apparatus on the driveways in your area? Um, we, the concrete, uh, it's all concrete driveway. We don't have any, any unpaved driveway. It's all concrete. And we, our apparatus is too heavy. We will collapse a driveway. We'll crush a driveway. And I've, I've accidentally done it before. I, I was trying to do a three-point turn. When I used to drive, I backed the back wheels up into a driveway and, and broke a driveway. Our apparatus is too heavy for driveways. All right. Uh, we to give a shout out to, uh, actually, I had a nice conversation with our brother, Danny Sheridan. And, uh, our topic next month is going to be, if you want to call it the hand of God, you want to call it divine intervention. You want to call it subconscious thinking and decision-making. All of us have had situations where you took an action you that you really at the time didn't really know why you did it, but it ended up being the good call. So was it something in your subconscious mind? Uh, I could give you one example. I had a guy open up a wall and there was a plastered over electrical uh, receptacle and he opened it up and I said, open up a bay on either side. He did. And then 
he proceeded to open up some more base. And I said, Dave, that's it. That's it. That's enough. Sure enough, he opened up another bay, like two bays late past. There's another light fixture smoldering. They were connected. And I said, Dave, why did you do this? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. And all of us have had that type of event. So um, that's what we're going to look at next next month. Uh, before we say goodbye to everybody, uh, our, our thanks to key, keyhose.com. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy endorsement for me because that's what my department uses and that's what my department uses extensively every day it's being right now it's being dragged across asphalt and over window sills at our training facility so um, would everybody like to close out with uh, just a goodbye or final thoughts Captain Mike goodbye alright Chief Bobby Sorry. Yeah. Hey, great hangout. You know, I think a lot of stuff came up outside in fires, you know, um, shameless pitch. I did a nice webcast uh, podcast the other day with Danny on the National Firemen's Journal podcast show and, and uh, looking forward to getting all of you. Dan's promised me several times, never showed up. Or <laughs> Sam stands me up consistently and Dave won't take my calls. But, um, you know, I'd love to have all of you. Seriously, Clark, if you have some time, I'd love to have all of you come on. And it's a nice little podcast show. But uh, Danny had some really cool things to share. Um, great conversation. There's so much, man, we could, we could go for another three days on this. Uh, you know, it's a hugely, wickedly important topic. It really is. Uh, the, there's few things worse than fire above your head. You know, it, it, and as Clark was describing, just energy, energy and, and, and weight, you know. And, and we always call it lightweight construction. So we put up a little quote in there. It's lightweight until it hits you on the head. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. nothing light about it. Yeah. So, hey, good, good hangout. Looking forward to next month. All right, Brother Dan. Uh, always a pleasure, Bill. Always great to talk with this group. Uh, the one thing I would share, the two things I, that, that stick with me out of this conversation is, one, you know, especially I know from, from my experience of going to fires that worked out well and don't work out well is, when we don't locate and recognize where the fire is, it is problematic. So make sure that you are understanding where exactly the fire is before you decide to go through that front door. Is it in the basement? Is it in the attic? Where do they originate? Where can you mount your attack? Because if we don't locate, confine a compartment, then extinguish, it becomes problematic. And that second part uh, is, you know, we talked about some ingenious ideas of, you know, different tactics to be able to fight fire. Yeah, those things are great, but you can't make them up in a vacuum. And you can't do it the minute you pull up on the fire. Ground. Like, you know, I heard Gustin talk about this one time. Not the time for it. You know, have plan A through Z or how you're going to attack each one of these types of fires and train on it and drill on it and hone it. So all you have to do is get up like you're, you're the quarterback recognizing the defense. Is this call to play? And everyone knows what they're supposed to do, and then you can execute. But uh, again, Bill, thanks. Another great uh, hangout. Professor Dave, are you still with us, sir? I'm still with you. All uh, right. Thanks for the invite. I just want everybody's commented on the locate the fire. And, you know, think back years ago, that wasn't always so hard because you pulled up, it was blown out a dozen windows. And today with all the thermal pane windows and insulation and sometimes finding that fire is a lot more of a challenge. So I think the, we can't let the, the urgency of the moment make us rush into anything until we really understand what we have. But uh, thank you for the invitation. Great information, guys. And again, and thank you for what you're doing for your folks up there in New York State. And it's all archived. It's all great stuff that we need to review. Uh, your incident command, as I said last week, was spot on. And you have a unique talent to take something that's fairly dry and make it lively uh, and interesting. And uh, thank you so much for participating today. Brother Sam, you still there, my brother? I am. Um, I, first of all, I want to say, uh, Dave, that was uh, great having you on here. I personally enjoyed um, listening to you. Um, I think uh, Captain Gustin was completely wrong. Um, the other thing I want to do is um, piggyback on uh, exactly what you were saying, Captain. Um, I've got some pictures here where you talk about that wire lath and plaster um, being put on um, some two buys and then um, pulling it from the doorway. So I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Can you guys see that? 
Yep. Yeah, that's a picture I got from you. Yep. So that's here's it. your uh, here's your one buys. It all comes down yep. at once. Here's your big sections coming down. Um, so exactly what you're saying. Um, work from the doorway, and then uh, once you uh, you know that it's not going to come down on you, open up from the middle of the room. That's usually where there's less valuables, unless we put them there, right, Clark? And then um, the other thing is it allows us to uh, get the angles with the host stream. Uh, All right. All right, fellas. Um, Bill, just a question. You're going to have sensitivity training for everybody after this? <laughs> Listen, as soon as I get done with I'm going, you guys, you guys, you hurt my feelings. I'm going into my safe space. <laughs> as soon as I, I have got to have some quiet time for myself because a couple of you guys did not, you do not agree with me 100% and you hurt my self-esteem. So I'm going in my safe space as, few, as soon as I get. Now, the fact that I'm taking a bottle of rum with me into my safe space, that's just coincidental. Just Guys, don't take your uh, jitterbug night, phone with you. Good night, Gracie. We're out of time. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. God bless you. Till next.